I want to give you some examples of French Gothic manuscripts. And we're going to look at some from the 13th and the 14th century, so high to late Gothic. Um, previously, we're always talking about the manuscripts as being created by the monks or the nuns in the scriptoria of abbeys or monasteries or convents. But with the high and late Middle Ages, manuscript illumination also is created with craftsmen who this is their job and sometimes craftswomen as well. Um, Paris becomes the center for secular man manuscript illumination. So you could buy a handwritten book, a manuscript, and you could buy one that is illustrated, you know, what, on the market. So, you know, highly skilled painters and scribes are creating this. Um, the manuscripts are produced by lay artists rather than the monks or the nuns. And like most of the craft guilds, um, they have a, a, a trade guild for artisans who produce books. And this is the confraternity of St. John the Evangelist, of course, who is uh, credited with writing the Gospel of St. John and also uh, credited with writing the uh, Book of Revelation or the Apocalypse. Uh, and so, you know, people who are associated with the book-making trade, uh, here we're talking about literally creating books, uh, would be members of the confraternity of St. John the Evangelist. Um, and this would include book binders as well as the scribes uh, who illuminate and, of course, the artists who, or the scribes who copy out the manuscript, the text, and uh, also the scribes who illuminate them. Uh, not every text, not every book is illuminated, only you know, the luxury trade. But as but the upper middle class grows in the high and late Middle Ages, um, and literacy also grows, um, more people may want manuscripts. Of course, many of these we associate with the uh, uh, the kings and the queens, but uh, you know, rich, uh, rich merchants sometimes could also uh, afford manuscripts. Okay. Illuminated manuscripts are very expensive. They are luxury goods. How was the workshop organized? Well, you had a head person in the workshop, a chef d'atelier. And he would lay out the book. Now, he would organize it, he'd plan it all out. Uh, and, you know, give the different scribes the different parts that they're supposed to copy. I'm, I'm assuming a uh, workshop that has a number of workers. Um, and, you know, he would write the subject of any illuminations in the page margins so people would know what they're supposed to create. Um, then, you know, the pages are given to the scribe. And, uh, you know, these would be not necessarily in the exact order that they'd come out because, you know, they would fold them into quartos or folios. And so you might have, you know, one section of the book uh, that you're working on where someone else is working on another section. Uh, and the scribe would copy out the text and they would leave the space to put the pictures in. All this would be planned out. Uh, and then uh, they would be passed to the artist who specialize in painting. And, you know, some might do primarily borders or initials. And, and some might do the narrative uh, scenes that you know, perhaps take up an entire page or a large part of a page. We're looking at some of the uh, one of the pages from the Psalter of Saint Louis, uh, and this is 13th century, uh, 1253 uh, to 1270. Uh, a Psalter, of course, we have already heard about, say, the Utrecht Psalter in the Carolingian period. A Psalter is a book of psalms, and this was the Psalter that was owned by Saint Louis. Uh, Saint Louis was actually the king 
He was King Louis the Ninth. And he was considered to be so devout that he was actually canonized as a saint. And this was his Psalter. Uh, today, the manuscript is in the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris. Uh, the two libraries that I guess you could say vie for the title of the greatest libraries in the world that have the most manuscripts would be the Bibliothèque Nationale and the Vatican Library. Um, and in Bibliothèque Nationale, the way they lay out the numbering system, uh, we can see right here, uh, you would first, you know, say either Paris Bibliothèque Nationale or Bibliothèque Nationale Paris. Uh, MS, of course, stands for manus manuscript, uh, manuscript, uh, and LAT here is abbreviated for Latin. So they categorize them first by the language of the manuscript. Uh, you might remember that the Vivian Bible, the 9th century uh, Carolingian Bible, was Latin 1. <laughs> in, it was the first one acquired uh, in the uh, Bibliothèque Nationale. But they all have numbers. And as you can see, this is quite a high number, uh, about 10,525. Uh, and then each page is given a folio number. Um, they're not numbered, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. They're numbered by the page recto and verso. In other words, front side of the page, back side of the page. Uh, a lot of times with recto, they don't put a little r there. Um, you know, they put the number of the page. This is the seventh page. Uh, and then it's verso is the v. This is tiny. It blows up very nicely. I mean, you know, uh, the days when we projected slides on the screen, you know, we had this huge image. But it's only five inches high by three and a half inches wide. It's a tiny little thing. And held in your hand, carried with you. You could say your devotions. Uh, it's richly illustrated. Uh, it has 78 or more Old Testament full page illuminations. Um, one of the interesting things about it is the subject is not necessarily related to the text of the psalm. Uh, it's used as a devotional text, and you know, presumably Louis can, knows the stories of the Bible, so he would recognize those. Uh, so um, you know, to us that seems a little odd. Why don't you illustrate the psalms? You know, maybe the way the Utrecht Psalter did it with a uh, Gothic style. But these actually are scenes from the Old Testament. Uh, and not always, you know, what you would expect to see in a, in a Psalter. But it was uh, Saint King Louis' devotional book. And he can have it painted any way he wants. <laughs> These are, the figures are painted in a very courtly style. With graceful figures, curving lines, um, and you might notice the, the way the angel stands here is the posture, the, the hip shot pose, you know, he stands there and uh, sways to one side. Uh, the draperies swing, swing around, you know, in beautiful arches. And of course, there's this wonderful border, uh, you know, what curly cues and animals and, you know, it's what some kind of abstract designs. Uh, and then the background, uh, well, the background's kind of strange in a sense. If you're expecting realism, don't expect that. Uh, you have, as you can see, uh, Gothic architecture. This is a stylized version of the windows at uh, Saint-Chapelle. So Saint-Chapelle is the... Uh, Holy Chapel for the Royal Palace. So it's, you know, it's Louis Chapel. Uh, and here we see it as the background of his uh, images in his Psalter. Okay, I also want to point out that you have two scenes here. Uh, one is when Abraham is uh, 
what is meeting the angels, essentially. And the second one is Abraham entertaining or uh, providing a feast for the angels. So I want to talk about the subject. Uh, and you might notice that the, the two scenes are divided with a tree, uh, an oak tree, uh, mm-hmm. as it were. Uh, and uh, it, you know, it's shown with sort of great, big, giant oak leaves and acorns. Uh, once again, it's quite stylized. Uh, yeah, I don't think in um, ancient Judea, uh, Holy Land, they had oak trees. Remember, this is not uh, somebody who knows the geography, the topography, the botany of the ancient world. No, no archaeologists. Um, so he's, you know, he's showing it's an outdoor scene by putting this tree in the middle. So Abraham is entertaining the angels. Um, according to the Bible, uh, three messengers from God. And the word angel uh, comes from the word for messenger. So three messengers come from God, three men. Uh, they are uh, identified you know, in Exodus as angels, and so they have uh, wings here, you can see, uh, and halos. Uh, and uh, they, they come to Abraham, and they tell him that his wife, Sarah, who is 80 years old, is going to bear a child. And that child, Isaac, will become the father, you know, Abraham will become the father of a great nation through this child. Yeah, um, you might notice that his wife is, I don't know if you can make it out in the, the reproduction, but his wife is grinning. She's in the little tent there like, oh yeah, sure, I'm 80. I'm really going to have a baby. Miraculously, it happens. Uh, Isaac is born and he is believed to be, uh, you know, through, he, Abraham is the father of a great nation through Isaac uh, and his descendants, um, the Hebrew people. Uh, I might point out a few things in this uh picture, uh, you'll notice that uh, the three angels are you know, standing there. We'll take a look, little closer look at the uh, standing for, for, foremost angel. Uh, Abraham is sinking to his knees. He's recognized them uh, and uh, evidently as angels and should be paid homage or respect. Uh, he's wearing what almost like a little funnel on the top of his head. And this particular cap was one, um, was a Jew hat. It was a way that uh, they identified the Jews of the Middle Ages, uh, and they are frequently shown uh, even on Old Testament Jews uh, in manuscripts. He's taken off his hat, though, when he's uh, providing the food for the angels. The angel, the figures have elongated proportions. Uh, there's some, you know, a beautiful curling uh, beards there uh, with Abraham's beard. Uh, you know, it's a pretty beautiful decoration. And this is a court style. Now, I want to compare the painted angel with some figures we've seen at Rams Cathedral. And, you know, the, the dates for these kind of overlap, so they're almost, you know, we're not sure of the exact dates of some of the things, but you know, they're close to being contemporary. Uh, 1145 to 55 for St. Joseph and the Smiling Angel uh, at Rams, uh, and the uh, Angel of the Psalter of St. Louis, sometimes between 1253 uh, to 70, the reign of, of, uh, of uh, King Louis. Um, and one of the things that I think is really interesting is the development of greater naturalism in Gothic art. Uh, you see it developing in sculpture first, probably because sculpture actually is a three-dimensional medium. And then the painters have a two-dimensional medium, you know, it's flat, and they have to somehow try to show depth. 
So it seems to uh, take longer for them to figure out you know, ways of, of showing depth. I mean, overlapping is, is obviously it's, it's one way. But I want you to notice the similarities between the painted angel and these two figures uh, carved by the uh, master of the smiling angel or the master of Saint Joseph. We don't know who he is, the same person uh, evidently car car carved uh, both of these figures at uh, Rams. Uh, one of the things you'll notice is uh, this you know, beautiful curves of the drapery being pulled up, uh, you know, falling down. Um, the drapery is much less intricate in the painting uh, but you do have sort of these uh, some U-shaped folds and uh, the uh, drapery being pulled up uh, to reveal the undergarment as well. So this, this cloak or outer garment is, is pulled up and, and you can see the long garment beneath. Um, also, you have the, the hip shot position, this uh, kind of S-shaped, or in this case, reverse S-shaped, uh, where the, you know, the head is curving around and then the body curves out at the hip uh, and then uh, curves in. So you have very, very graceful forms. Um, there's also the elongation of the figures, you know, sort of small heads and uh, graceful, slender, elongated bodies. Well, let's look at a few other pictures just to give you the, you know, the feel of this uh, manuscript. Uh, we have here one of uh, Rebecca and Eliezer. Uh, this is more in the story of Abraham and Isaac. Um, Abraham does have the son. Uh, Sarah gives birth to the son, Isaac, and she survives the birth. Uh, so uh, kind of amazing. Um, and uh, Isaac grows up to be a young man, and Abraham wants to provide him with a wife. Um, so they're living among you know, people who have who are not uh, Hebrews. So they would like he would like to find a um, you know, within his sort of relatives who are distant, uh, find a wife. So he sends off his trusted man, Eliezer, uh, to find a bride for Isaac. And uh, you see, presumably, Abraham giving him the instructions, you know, go get a wife for my son. Go, 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 go find her. Uh, and as he, uh, you know, approaches uh, the place where these people live, um, and you can see he has uh, those wonderful camels with these very graceful necks, uh, sort of very stylized camels. I doubt that the artist had ever seen a camel. Uh, Eliezer prays to God, how am I going to know the right girl? You know, how, how can I pick a proper wife for my, my um, master's son? Um, and so he, he prays about it. And he says, um, you know, there's, of course, it's desert country uh, that, and he sees the, the girls, the women coming to the well uh, and getting water for the, you know, for the family. And he says that um, let, when he, you know, when he goes and asks for water, let the one who's, you know, the right bride offer also to give the water to my camels. In other words, that she'll think about the animals. She'll be, she'll be a kind person. Uh, and so he goes, and uh, Rebecca offers drink both to Eliezer and, you know, fills up the, I guess, presumably a camel trough, uh, which we see there. And the camels have their necks down. <laughs> kind of interesting way they're posed. Uh, and she's poured, she's poured water for the camels to drink as well. Uh, so he finds the right girl, presumably. And you know we see the the some of the things we've talked about previously with the uh, Abraham and the three angels. Uh, we see the decorative border uh, created with the curly cues and uh, some of the animal shapes uh, at the corners and uh, uh, decorative forms. We see the background here. You can see it clearer because there's no tree in the foreground. Uh, that this looks like a shape of the side of the exterior of Saint-Chapelle. Uh, we see our two scenes. Uh, in the one scene, we have 
Now, Abraham seated there giving directions to Eliezer, and Eliezer is kneeling before him. So Abraham is actually taking on a, kind of the role of the king. So we have these sort of courtly manners, in a sense, as the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the servant kneels to the king uh, who gives him his orders. Uh, and once again, you know, elongated, graceful figures. Uh, the other one shows a battle scene, uh, Joshua at the Battle of Jericho. Uh, the borders are still decorative, but they've changed uh, to stylized form. Some of them look like the, they might be stylized acanthus, but really stylized. Uh, and uh, they are shown as though the battle is uh, taking place in the 12th century. Uh, the uh, warriors, you see uh, cavalry. Uh, I don't know whether Joshua had any horses. I don't remember reading that in the Bible. Uh, but at any rate, we have um, you know the knight who is on horseback, and that's what marks a knight. He has this uh, very expensive uh, beast uh, who can uh, transport him and, and gives him an advantage in battle. Um, so he is uh, in chain mail uh, with a shield. Uh, so it's contemporary 12th century armor. Uh, and they are entering Jericho, as you can see, which is a, a sort of a stylized little, very, very compact little walled city. Uh, but once again, taking place as though these were uh, almost stained glass windows of, um, of Saint-Chapelle, you know, taking place against the background of, of the Holy Chapel. Um, a little bit earlier, and I probably should put this one earlier, this is the drunkenness of Noah. So uh, well before the uh, other scenes as far as uh, the order. Um, and once again, elegant figures. Um, of course, the story of the drunkenness of Noah, he's sometimes called the Hebrew Bacchus, is after the flood and uh, Noah and his family and uh, the animals have been saved. Um, Noah creates fermented wine from the grape and evidently didn't realize the power of it uh, and becomes drunk and falls asleep and evidently, uh, you know, falls asleep uh, with his, his garments in disarray so he's naked. Uh, and uh, he has three sons and uh, two of them kind of laugh at him and uh, the, one of the sons comes and covers him up and shows respect for his father. Uh, sometimes this is a scene as a kind of Eucharistic scene because it does have wine. Um, we think that may be the part of the reason that uh, Michelangelo included it over the altar at uh, the Sistine Chapel in the 16th century. Uh, but it also shows a, a filial duty, in other words, the son uh, showing respect for his father. And that even after the great flood that was supposed to wipe out all the evildoers, people do continue to sin. But once again, this is shown uh, at, uh, as though it were taking place in front of Saint-Chapelle. And uh, the grapevine is this uh, wonderful stylized curly hue uh, here, and elegant elongated figures. Okay. Um, in some cases, we do know the names of the artist who created the manuscripts. They are written in the manuscripts. Um, and so here is a uh, page from a manuscript, uh, the breviary of uh, Philippe uh, IV, uh, by Master Honoré. So the artist is Master Honoré. And once again, this is from the Bibliothèque Nationale, as you might expect, uh, Latin 1023, uh, folio 7, verso. It's around 8 by 5 inches, a little bit smaller than that. And it is a secular workshop that has created this. So this is, you know, Parisian manuscript illumination from secular workshops, not monks and nuns, but lay people who have the trade of creating manuscripts. It dates from very late in the 13th century, from 1296. 
And uh, we're seeing here two scenes, uh, one on top of each other. Uh, as you can see, they uh, there are also some uh, handy uh, uh, inscriptions to name uh, who these people are so we can be sure that we've got the right story. Uh, but at the top, we have Samuel anointing David. And of course, David's brothers are pretty upset. You know, he's the youngest. Why is he getting all the attention? Why should he be anointed? Um, and then down below, we see the uh, story of David and Goliath, uh, where David goes up Uh, David goes up against uh, the giant warrior, Goliath. And you can see David is showing it once again as a young boy. Uh, the King Saul is standing there. Goliath is even larger than Saul. He's, you know, almost to the top of the section of the page. Uh, and David is uh, in the process. He's throwing the stone with his slingshot, uh, and uh, Goliath has got his head up like, oh man, this really hurts. <laughs> He's been struck by the stone, but it has not yet fallen down. Uh, and then presumably he keels over, and we can see David uh, in the process of decapitating uh, Goliath, uh, the Philistine warrior. Stylistically, the page is conceived as, you know, it's flat, it's decorative. You have pattern backgrounds. You know, he's not trying to say, uh, paint you a realistic landscape. You have these uh, decorative forms, almost like a tapestry is hanging down behind the, uh, the scene of David and Goliath. Uh, you do have some indications that takes place outdoors. You can, you can see some of these uh, tree forms. The figures are graceful, linear, uh, and if you look at the draperies, uh, which you know, once again curve over, uh, have beautiful uh, curving uh, hemlines and uh, graceful folds, uh, they have some shading. They have highlights and shadows. So they're really showing you in the figures an attempt to show three-dimensionality. Uh, and, of course, you can see figures one behind each other. Uh, the figures actually, in the case of both Saul and Goliath, extend beyond the boundaries of the frame. No oh, feet. And so the feet are uh, on the edge of the frame, uh, and so the toes stick down beyond that. And you can see also that David is uh, uh, wielding, uh, presumably, Saul's sword uh, to cut off the head of Goliath. Maybe it's Goliath's sword to cut off the head of Goliath. Uh, he's... Uh, the sword goes out beyond the boundaries. Uh, so this idea of something that can extend beyond, it has that space to do it in, and yet it's a very shallow space with either the gold leaf or the gold leaf and patterns uh, and in the background. So you have here a mixture of Elements that suggest space, you know, shading the figures, figures that overlap, uh, figures that uh, you know, extend beyond the borders of the, uh, of the uh, manuscript frame, uh, as it were, the painted frame, of course. Uh, and yet, you also have some elements that limit the space and are very decorative. Now we're getting into the late Gothic period um, with a early 14th century book of hours. The artist is Jean Poussel, and these are the hours, or the book of hours of Jean de, Jean de Oeuvre. <laughs> I probably didn't pronounce that correctly. Um, 1325 to 28. She is the Queen of France. So this is the Queen's prayer book, devotional book. It's, it's tiny. Uh, they're showing you here a facsimile, uh, give you, and uh, it's very tiny, uh, about three and a half by two and a half inches. She could hold it in the palm of her hand. It contains 208 folios, 
pages, if you will, um, back and front. Uh, so that would be, what, 418 backs and fronts pages? And 25 full-page pictures. We're going to look, we already saw, and we'll take another look at the uh, paired images from the infancy and passion of Christ. And also, uh, although I don't think I have pictures of this, there are scenes from the life of St. Louis. Predecessor on her husband's throne. So, Jeanne de Voix, uh, the Queen of France, uh, and her Book of Hours. Now, what is the Book of Hours? Book of Hours was the most popular book in the late Middle Ages, in the 14th and 15th centuries. And essentially what it was, was a devotional book for laity, for men and women who were not uh, making religious vows. One of the hallmarks of late medieval devotions is a desire on the part of laity to have some of the spiritual benefits that the religious did. So, you know, you have monks and nuns who pray, and they're supposed to be praying for everybody. Uh, that's their job. But eventually, some of the lay people think, well, you know, maybe I should be doing some of this. But I can't really. Um, you know, I have other distractions. I've got children. I've got a kingdom to rule. I've got a, a trade to, you know, I've got to raise money for my family to live on. You know, I've got all these other things going on. Um, you know, I've got my duties as the queen. Um, but they still would like to have some of that spiritual benefits. Uh, they can't, uh, as, say, a monk or nun would do, stop eight times during the day or night, you know, get up out of bed or stop whatever they're doing and go to the church and have a service. This is what is called the divine office or the canonical hours. And, you know, every person in a monastery convent uh, was required. Sometimes they did uh, the night hours, they did combine them. So they only had to get up maybe once, but, you know, they have... Uh, then seven with one one of the eight hours put together. Um, and so these are called the canonical hours, the hours of the rule uh, for the monasteries. What developed was a short version, a book that contained such things as prayers, responsive readings, psalms, so a devotional book. Um, and since the lay people couldn't stop, you know, all these times during the day and night, um, they could say the prayers when they could. Oh, often they'd take them to church, and while the service was going on, be reading the prayers for themselves. Um, but you know, they could take smaller amounts of time uh, for their devotions. And these are known as the Book of Hours. Now, when they're in manuscript form, uh, they can be customized for people. Uh, they also, of course, uh, the the, the um, secular workshops uh, probably did a really good business of turning these things out. They do not all have pictures. You know, the only ones we are interested in in the art history classes have pictures. Um, but of course, uh, you know, many of them would be made for people uh, who. Um, weren't quite as wealthy as the royalty and the aristocrats uh, and uh, you know might not have pictures or might have fewer pictures. Uh, I, this is not only for the royalty, it's also for the educated elite and often um, by the later Middle Ages uh, wealthy merchants uh, you know would be uh, they'd still be they'd look down as as middle class they're not royalty but you know, as they as they make their fortunes, um, you know, they do, you might say, ape their betters. I don't know that they're really their betters, but, um, you know, they they do want to do some of, they want to wear more beautiful clothes, have, you know, more uh, wonderful lodgings, uh, you know, their homes, have beautiful homes, and uh, they'd like to have some books of hours. Um, in this case, we have a royal book of hours. Uh, today, it is in uh, the uh, collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in the cloisters, 
which is in Fort Tyrone Parts, not part of the uh, uh, the Fifth Avenue um, uh, Metropolitan Museum. And as I said, very, very tiny. You know, hold this in your hand. It's precious. It's intimate. Uh, here we see one of the initials. And uh, in the initial, it shows the queen at her devotion. She's uh, kneeling at a pray do, uh, which is a little kneeling bench, and you could uh, rest your book on it and uh, you have a little place to kneel. Uh, here, in this case, it's covered with a cloth, so we can't really see the details of it. Uh, and as I said, this is the you know, this is the rise in personal devotions by laity during the late Middle Ages. Okay. In this book, you have an image from the Passion of Christ. In other words, uh, the last days of Christ, um, you know, when he is tormented and eventually uh, killed on the cross. Uh, and these face the infancy image, the, the images from uh, the birth, the childhood of Christ. What we're seeing here is the arrest of Christ on one side and the Annunciation on the other side. There's not a whole lot of color. You see little bits of blues and reds, but for the most part, the figures are in grisaille or gray. Uh, so the shading is in, what, tones of gray uh, and you have a light highlights, you have dark areas, and this gives the illusion of solidity. And you know, you could also see how the draperies wrap the figures, how the figures turn in space. The page almost, it, it, what I said, it, they're trying to create the illusion that you actually have three three dimensions on on the page. So not only the grisai shading of the figures, but you can see this little house. Uh, the house in which the nativity takes place. Uh, and it is uh, shown three-dimensionally. You have a little, uh, it goes back into space. You can see the floor. You can see the ceiling that uh, slope backwards. And our, you know, Mary can stand within. Her, her head's almost up to the ceiling, but you know, she can stand within. Uh, and then you have this little porch where the angel uh, is behind the post, giving you, once again, a spatial illusion. Uh, and one of his wings, uh, you know, comes out on the other side of the other post, so you can, you know, really sort of locate him in space. You now, as though he is behind the column. We think we have a source for this. Um, was Puchel in Italy? Did he see what Duccio was doing in his Maestà altarpiece? One of the small images, uh, this is the Annunciation of the death of the Virgin rather than the Annunciation that Christ will be born, uh, has a, a similar kind of space box uh, showing. Uh, and it's a bit earlier, it's, uh, 1308 to 11. Uh, Mary is seated in uh, a room that has uh, what slanting rafters uh, the floor and the ceiling are tipped to give you and the walls are tipped in to give you this the uh, feeling that she's within a uh, a space of a room uh, the angel here as you can see is actually not behind the column um Pucel has gone further than duccio in showing the angel behind the column uh, but he's coming uh, sort of in front of this uh, little portico holding uh, a palm rather than uh, the lilies, uh, symbolizing that Mary will soon die. She'll be able to go to heaven and be reunited with her son. And there's also something else kind of interesting. You might notice that uh, the little house almost seems to float on the page uh, right above the inscription and there actually is an angel who's holding up the edge of the house well this is a reference to the holy house of loreto uh, there was a little house uh, in italy uh, loreto that claimed to be the actual house where 
the angel appeared to Mary in her house uh, to tell her that she would bear the Christ child. Now, how did it get to Italy? Well, the legend was that angels uh, picked up Mary's house in Nazareth and carried it to Italy. And so, you know, this seems to be a, a reference to the holy house of Loreto, uh, which, you know, once again, did Pucel go down to Italy? Uh, or was the fame so great? Now, I'm sure you may notice that at the bottom of the page, what we call the bas de page, or the bottom of the page in French, uh, there is uh, another scene going on. What is this? Uh, it's been identified as a game, a game called Froggy in the Middle or Frog in the Middle. It's a secular subject. It's kind of like blind man's bluff and tag combined. Um, you know, somebody's the froggy in the middle and they're blindfolded and people go out and, I guess, hit them. And then that person's supposed to catch them, you know, run off and catch them. Um, and that's a secular subject. What the heck does it have to do with the manuscript? Uh, there are secular images in the margins and the bodipage. Uh, but one idea is that perhaps this is a, a secular game, you know, where uh, you, you actually do hit people. <laughs> um, you know, and then they're supposed to go tag you. Uh, and so it's been suggested that perhaps that game is a, a reference to the arrest of Christ, you know, where Christ is... Um, of course, will be then the mocking of Christ and uh, will be uh, buffeted uh, by his tormentors. We see here the carrying of the cross on one page and on the other page, uh, the Annunciation to the Shepherds with a little bas de page uh, as well. And figures crawling up the side too. Uh, looks like there's a little angel looking out. So those may be shepherds. I uh, can't quite tell. This may be shepherds outside the main image. Uh, here is the crucifixion page with the adoration of the Magi on the next se section. And in this case, the bas de page is a part of the story. It's the massacre of the innocents. Um, the adoration of the Magi was believed to be... Um, well, St. Saint, Saint Augustine on, uh, when Christ manifests himself to the Gentile world. There's a, the idea of the universality of Christ's message. And of course, uh, on the crucifixion, Christ sheds his blood for, uh, to atone for all the sins of mankind. Uh, we have an entombment. Uh, when Christ is placed within the tomb. On the other side, the flight into Egypt. Uh, and here's one of the scenes from the, the story of St. Louis. St. Louis very humbly is washing the feet of the poor, which of course is Christ, uh, you know, you, you think of Christ washing the feet of the apostles. Um, and the text page has uh, uh, verses from the uh, office of St. Louis, the uh, prayers that are associated with his devotion. Uh, and then you have calendar pages. Now these are, uh, you have the uh, bodipage showing a kind of genre scene or a scene of everyday activities. You know, this is November. What goes on in November? What, what are the activities of the month? Um, and of course, uh, what they're showing is the gathering of acorns by the hogs. And uh, the swine herd is, uh, has this big club, this cudgel, and he's knocking uh, the trees so the acorns fall off. And uh, this is how they fatten up the hogs uh, for uh, slaughter uh, so that they will have meat that lasts through the winter. Now, if you would like to see a website with images from the uh, pages of the Hours of Jean de Voix, you can go to the Metropolitan Museum of Arts website and uh, you will find them there. And here is the Earl.